So if you want like, to film that guy who lost his house and everything, friends and all of that in the tsunami, I chose to get him to take me to his house, which was a pile of rubble on the ground. But it was a powerful thing that I needed in the film to make the audience realise how bad it was. And also we needed someone's personal story in there to build up the emotions and also the tsunami in the film was a little story within a bigger story because at the end you see that guy smiling. You see that the experience of building one of these buildings and being involved in it has changed his life. Mm -hmm. And he's so optimistic at the end and at the beginning he was pretty down. So you've got to choose to bring those characters in and you've got to make the choice to follow those people. You know, it's not going to happen unless you do it. So it's not just about sitting and watching and filming. You know, you've got to make decisions and it will bring, a, you know, sometimes bring people together that may have come together two days after you left but you wouldn't have been there you would have missed it so you've got to make something happen I mean I don't do too much of that but as long as it's relatively within what would happen or what is happening it's fine you know to do yeah. that you have to kind of work at it you do have to direct people a little bit even with documentary yeah mm -hmm. and also uh, I suppose we shot it like a feature film in terms of the action shots and the helicopter shots and air shots and getting cars to drive over the camera instead of going past the camera, you know, you get them to drive over the camera mm -hmm. between the wheels at 60 miles an hour on a beach, you know, it is way more dramatic than just filming a pan as a car goes past, you know, because yeah. it kind of makes people jolt in their seats when they see it, you know. There's obviously things like that and the way I, you know, we, we shot him on his motorbike and I don't know, it does help make a story more watchable or more dramatic, yeah. So lots of time lapses and a couple of crane shots and, you know, I think it all helps. And really good grading, which we had a, a colourist that just made it look amazing, the colours of the film. So visually it's there and narratively, you know, the editor is so important to have a good editor. And it was a difficult struggle to edit. Obviously, you've got to have the material to edit. So yeah. You can't vent it out of thin air. But so yeah, it's been a you know it's been a hard slog, but it's been worth it. I think we've got a really entertaining movie. So mm -hmm. I know that at the beginning of the project, it was envisaged that it was going to be a forty-minute TV type, you know, documentary, maybe like a Channel Four, one of those series. And then three years later and 350 hours worth of footage later, as you were funding this yourself, you know, was there any point that you were tempted to go, well, actually, I've got footage up to this now. I need to make something out of this because I can't go on because the funding isn't there. Or Because it seems to me that you think that you were getting to the end and then something else would happen mm. and you'd have to carry on and then something else would happen. So, Well, what actually happened was I, I started filming Mike and the British project here in Stanmer Park in Brighton and I thought I'd have a 40 minute TV thing and, and I pitched it to broadcasters and they just said this is just another episode of Grand Designs you know there's nothing new I mean Grand Designs were already doing some green episodes on green housing and so what's the difference it's a little more radical but there's nothing that I was really offering that was any different than that other than I was on a more ground level with the crew and I was trying to make them my characters rather than having a presenter but I just couldn't sell it. I just could not sell the English story as a one-off piece. If I had a series on green architecture, sure, five other green houses, maybe, but you have to be Landmark or, I don't know, whoever these big companies are that do regular stuff for the broadcasters, for series. Mm -hmm. So for me, as an unknown first-time director, out of the question, no way would I I'd be able to offer them a series and they'd take me seriously. You have to go in as an independent filmmaker, to places like Storyville and, you know, get your film through that way. So I decided to go to New Mexico and follow the story out there. But even when I got out there, uh, I realised that it was most of the story was retrospective. And um, I don't want to do a retrospective. I didn't want to do it. I, I said, I need some action. There's no, I can't make a complete retrospective story about how you guys got shut down and then you recovered, but not quite. Mm -hmm. And it's just... No big deal for me. So I phoned up Mike and I said, look, I know that you rewrote the law seven years ago and you got it. they threw it out because he wasn't a popular guy. And he said, I need to recover and get back in with these guys, you know, so that they forget about the past and they'll accept me. I need to kind of become one of them a little bit and then they may take me seriously. 
I'm going to rewrite the law. The law is, is inadequate for our future chance to evolve. So he still felt that it was an injustice what happened to him. Nothing was paving the way for him to do anything radically different. He was a little bit hemmed in by the way they'd allowed him to carry on working there. So he said to me, I'm going to rewrite the law. So I said, OK, Mike, you rewrite the law and you call me when you're going to go to court or to the legislator with this and try and change, because that's what I want to film. That's what the story's going to be about. Mm -hmm. It's about change. It's about someone trying to take on the, the system and change it. And sure enough, he rang me back six months later. He said, I've rewritten the law. I'm going to the legislator in January. Meanwhile, I'd gone back to work, to work on Charlie in a chocolate factory for a whole year. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I just needed to earn some money, because, you know. And so I did, I earned some money, and when I finished, it was just in time, and I went straight out to New Mexico and into the legislature with him. And he'd bought a suit and did the whole thing, and it was it's all in the film. It was very funny, you know, him dressing up in a suit, because he's a real scruffy hippie, and him having to put a suit on is hysterical. So that's all in the film. Um, and that's really when it started for me. That's when I thought, oh, this is good. I'm onto something live and it's exciting. And I thought, OK, the retrospective story, I worry about that when I've stopped filming live stuff. But at the moment, it's just too good. So we just carried on filming. And then, of course, the tsunami happened. And Mike got some offers to go there. And I said, India's the best offer. I think they'll really appreciate this there. And they'll probably need it more than anyone else. Sure enough, it was the Andaman Islands and where well, they were inspired by it. So it made a brilliant part of the story. And then Hurricane Katrina happened and he decides to go back because he failed on the law. He goes back for a second try. I thought, I really want to film these guys, how they react to a green bill after Hurricane Katrina that was supposedly global warming hitting the US for the first time, mm -hmm. you know, landmark event, whatever. So I want to see how they react, thinking that they'd just pass it. God, oh my, this guy's got answers to... You know, we don't want any more of that New Orleans stuff. Let's uh, let's get these bills through quickly, these green bills. But no, no, you know, I was I was grossly disappointed in how they reacted. In fact, it turned out that New Mexico was doing rather well out of Hurricane Katrina because it was selling a lot of oil because the oil refineries in uh, <coughs> Texas or wherever it was were all flooded. So New Mexico wasn't that interested uh, in changing at all. So... I was struggling for an ending. I thought, I can't end the film on that depressing of him losing. I really wanted him to win. It would have been a great ending, him sort of jumping up and down on the Senate. <laughs> outside, <spray>. the, outside <laughs> the Senate, yeah, with yeah. this bill in his hand, you know, with his suit on. But uh, yeah, I even had a, a sign made up saying, the USA's first sustainable testing site, and I was going to, you know, do a crane shot of, of Mike putting that sign up. I even filmed it, in fact. I filmed the whole thing. And, of course, it was never the end of the film because he lost. But they said that they've got this Hurricane Rita had happened in Mexico and they needed to go and help some guys there demonstrate how build houses wouldn't blow away with a hurricane. And because they have wooden houses that just blow away every year, a hurricane, hurricane comes mm -hmm. and they have to rebuild everything. And So off we went and we went over the border from Texas and I just filmed them arriving there and, and getting on and start building and that's the end sequence of the film because it's just a real positive no, you've already seen it in the tsunami, you know the story, so there's no dialogue, it's just a music sequence with a sort of really optimistic track at the end and shots of kids banging the uh, piñata. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the kids are banging the piñata, all the sweets are falling out, the boys are there with the sledgehammers and Phil, our editors, cut the two together so the kids are banging, the bike and his crew are banging with sledgehammers and you've got the soundtrack and it's really an optimistic ending because there's piñatas for the future and even one of the kids has got a t-shirt on for the future as he's collecting plastic bottles and cleaning the beaches to uh, make this building happen so it's it's a kind of great ending really and i knew and it was over I, in fact i knew before i went to mexico that oh god when is this film ever going to be over <laughs> uh, but it, as soon as i knew we were going there i knew that was the ending that i wanted to get but it was difficult after shooting 350 hours of footage but when you're shooting a story where you, well, a film where you really don't quite know what the story is, you go off on tangents. So like the British project here is, I shot a lot of hours of footage on that for a good many months and I've used none of it in the film, mm -hmm. but I'll use it in the DVD extras. Mm -hmm. The DVD extras to this film are going to be amazing I and mean, it's almost a complete, you know, two discs, yeah. you know. We'll have like six hours of extras, mm -hmm. and it's real good stuff because it, there's a lot of informational stuff about Earthships and how they work, and all the stuff in the film that we had to take out. 
in the film you just need to know that they do work you don't need to know how they work mm -hmm. so all of that's extras for the DVD there's heaps of stuff in the tsunami and uh, oh, in the law courts it's all very funny um, yeah there were various stories that we uh, I went off on a tangent and shot a load of stuff that we never used mm -hmm. but you just can't tell because if it had become part of the story I would have killed myself if I hadn't shot it I mean well, it's just good camera practice to me if you've got the time to do it you know, I mean, one of the bits I went off on a tangent was when Mike turns up to court for the second time, he's actually trying to get funding as well, let's get his law through. And Richard Branson, Virgin Atlantic, they're introducing uh, flying tourists into space with his rockets. Mm -hmm. So uh, it turned into <coughs> Earthships versus spaceships because Mike's money was getting 